Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the book Sybil and the impact that this book had and that the subsequent movie and docudrama had on the mental health community and on how we understand dissociative identity disorder. So the book Sybil is about a woman named Shirley Ardell Mason. That was her real name. Sybil was a name that was used to protect her identity in the book. Allegedly, Mason had what we then called multiple personality disorder, and it's now called dissociative identity disorder. So essentially, it's when a personality splits into multiple personalities, and these personalities come out different times, and there's amnesia between them. There's a lot of criteria for this disorder, but either way, that's the quick version of what this disorder is. Now, this is an extremely controversial topic. Sybil, the book, everything that happened after that, but also DID in general, right? This is just something where we have a lot of polarization in the mental health community and to some degree in the general public. I used a variety of sources for this video, and I'll put the references for those sources in the description for this video. I'm going to try to avoid getting into whether or not DID is real. I've talked about this before in prior videos. Also, I'm not diagnosing anybody here in this video. I'm just speculating about what could have been happening in a situation like this. So Mason was born in 1923. She grew up in Minnesota. She was artistically gifted and evidently her mother displayed a lot of bizarre behavior. Mason had an active imagination. She liked making up stories and appeared to live in a world of fantasy some of the time. She began experiencing anxiety, depression, and blackouts, and eventually she sought treatment from a psychiatrist named Cornelia Wilbur. So again, Wilbur was a psychiatrist, not a PhD. So she could prescribe medication, and really this was in 1954 when Mason went to Wilbur. Psychiatry was very popular then, and other psychotherapy professions were not as popular, like counseling, social work, and psychology. So we see that it wouldn't have been unusual for somebody like Mason to go see a psychiatrist and not see another type of therapist at the same time. Now, Wilbur was heavily influenced by Sigmund Freud, so she was really somebody who subscribed to the psychoanalytic school of thought. And this kind of makes sense the more we look at this particular case and some of the decisions that she made. As I mentioned, this was around 1954. The treatment would last until 1965, so 11 years of treatment. Evidently, when Mason went to see Wilbur, Mason was aware that Wilbur had a special interest in multiple personality disorder. Wilbur had actually told Mason to read materials on this disorder. In 1973, Wilbur, in conjunction with an author named Schreiber, wrote a book named Sybil, The True Story of a Woman Possessed, by 16 separate personalities. Now this was supposed to be a true story. Information was changed to protect Mason's identity, but other than that, everything was supposed to be factual. Essentially, the book Sybil talks about the story of Shirley Mason. The character in the book was Sybil Dorset. The book talks about how she had multiple personalities, how she was mistreated when she was younger, how her mother had schizophrenia, and the book ends happily with the integration of all the personalities. So at the end of the book, Sybil, Mason, was cured. All her symptoms were gone, and everything was fine with her. It became a bestseller, and it made Dr. Wilbur both famous and wealthy. Now, this wasn't the first book we saw on a topic like this, like multiple personalities. In 1957, for example, we see another book named The Three Faces of Eve. But Sybil was by far the most popular book like this when it came out. It was really different than all the other books because of the impact that it had. Now, Mason's treatment started out without any mention of multiple personalities. Mason revealed a history of abuse when she was a child and a course of symptoms like anxiety and depression I mentioned before. Evidently, one day Mason came into therapy and claimed to be a girl named Peggy, a nine-year-old. Shortly after that, she said she was a 13-year-old named Vicky. Wilbur began injecting Mason with barbiturates, right? This was not terribly unusual for the 50s. 
and even for the 60s, but it still wasn't common either, right? So this was kind of deviating from the normal path that a psychiatrist would follow. But either way, this is what she did. And under the influence of these medications, we would see more personalities started coming out. And there were details of each personality that were being expanded on. So the personalities were becoming rich in detail, each taking on kind of a true identity of its own. Now these are referred to as alters. And as time progressed, again, there were more alters. Some were teenage girls, some were babies, some were little boys. Wilbur claimed to be accessing repressed memories. So memories that Mason had of her childhood that were too frightening or horrific were pushed down in her psyche, and Wilbur was somehow getting access to these memories and bringing them to the forefront. Now, of course, at this point, it is important to remember, as I mentioned before, that Wilbur was a Freudian. So this idea of repressed memories was highly consistent with the work of Sigmund Freud. Mason was reportedly highly suggestible and wanted to please Wilbur, so that's why she just kept expanding all the way up to 16 personalities. Now, four years after treatment started in 1958, Mason wrote a letter to Wilbur where she confessed that all the personalities were made up, and the history of maltreatment by her mother, that was fabricated as well. Wilbur dismissed this letter as a sign of resistance, again consistent with the psychoanalytic school of thought. But it's important to remember at this point, Wilbur was already planning a book, and she was regularly doing presentations about the case. So she was already invested at this point when Mason wrote her this letter saying that everything that Mason had indicated before was actually untrue. We also see that Mason was led to believe that if she did not have multiple personality disorder, she was not going to be seeing Dr. Wilbur anymore. Now, this would have been more than just the loss of another mental health clinician for Mason. There were a lot of boundaries being crossed in this relationship at the same time. Wilbur was paying Mason's rent, giving her clothes, spending time at her residence. This was, of course, highly unusual. Really, all these things are highly unusual. And, of course, supplying her with drugs. Wilbur was also spending 14 to 18 hours a week in therapy sessions with Mason. This, too, is highly irregular, even for back in the 50s. Now, the therapy continued. Wilbur continued to treat Mason. But Wilbur really wanted to do more than presentations. So I mentioned she was planning a book. But this book planning was because she was unable to publish this case study of Mason. Right? So if we look at the school of thought that was operating in psychiatry at that time, not many people believed that multiple personality disorder was real. Many believed in the idea of dissociation, but not going so far as to say there were separate personalities. So this wasn't considered scientific, and she couldn't get this published in scholarly journals. So again, this ties in with the book. Eventually, Wilbur and Mason crafted this idea to write the book, and again enlisted the help of Schreiber, and they were going to split the profits. Now, the reason Wilbur didn't write the book herself is because she wasn't actually a good writer. She needed somebody to write the book for her. And that's how Schreiber really got involved. Now, when Schreiber did get involved, she started fact-checking the story, as any good writer would do. And she started having doubts about the case. She confronted Wilbur and Mason about these doubts, but they didn't change their story. They stuck with this idea of multiple personalities. Now, we see here that the book really wasn't supposed to have a sad ending. They wanted to avoid that. So in 1965, Wilbur told Mason it was time, essentially, to get better. She said it was time to integrate the many personalities into the one original personality, just like that, after 11 years of treatment. A few weeks later, the extra personalities disappeared and never came back. So, just that quickly, Mason went from being somebody who had a chronic disorder to being fine. And this, again, was consistent with the narrative that they wanted to say in the book. There needed to be a successful treatment of the disorder to really have the impact that Dr. Wilbur was looking for. Now, interestingly, Schreiber did find that 1958 letter where Mason said that all this was just essentially nonsense. It was all just made up. And Wilbur told Schreiber that it was inconsequential and told her not to mention it in the book. And Schreiber did not include that information in the book Sybil. It's nowhere in that book. So we see that really important bit of information, again, in a ostensibly true story, was omitted. After the book was published, of course, it became a bestseller. 
very popular, very famous book, and people started figuring out that Sybil was actually Shirley Mason. People from her hometown kind of put two and two together when they read the book, and fairly soon after the book was published, pretty much everybody who wanted to know knew that Shirley Mason was Sybil. So Mason went into hiding, which I thought was kind of interesting. I don't know why she felt the need to go into hiding. People weren't mad at her character. When they read the book, they were fascinated with her. But maybe that was part of the problem. Maybe that element of fame was actually negative. People looking to interview her or things like that. But either way, she more or less went into hiding. And she leaned on Dr. Wilbur for support during this time. Now, this brings up an interesting issue and part of the controversy we see with this book, Sybil. So Mason would have signed a consent that said that her story could be used for the book. And in that consent, it should have said, if it didn't, that there was always this risk that people could discover who she really was. Of course, Wilbur was supposed to change information to avoid this from being a likely outcome, but there's no way to really prevent it 100%. So Mason probably knew this was, again, a possibility, and there's this question of whether or not Wilbur could have done more to protect her identity. Considering it seems like a lot of this was made up, I'm not sure where this really fits in anymore, right? It wasn't actually a real story. It would appear it wasn't anyway. But that's a concern I've seen mental health clinicians raise about this case. How did the public figure it out? Well, sometimes it's just not avoidable. And again, the consent should have contained that risk information. Mason should have known the risks. Whether she was capable of understanding those risks is really a separate issue. And Wilbur, of course, should have dealt with that issue and made sure that Mason really understood the potential consequences. Now, in 1997, we see Dr. Herbert Spiegel comes forward and accuses Wilbur of essentially committing fraud. He says Wilbur implanted false memories in Mason, helped Mason identify certain perspectives of herself by name, so really labeling memory and perception as a separate personality. He claimed to have filmed Mason, but he was unable to locate that film when he was asked to produce it. A year later, in 1998, we see Dr. Robert Reiber, who had audio tapes of sessions between Wilbur and Mason, indicated that Wilbur really suggested the altars to Sybil, right? So, to Mason. So essentially, just like we saw with Spiegel, Reiber was accusing Wilbur of fraud, or at least bad practice. In 2011, we see another book called Sybil Exposed that talked about some of this controversy as well with this idea that the disorder was made up by Wilbur, and it made a lot of accusations about inaccuracies in the book. We see that Dr. Cornelia Wilbur died in 1992 of Parkinson's disease, and Mason died in 1998 of breast cancer. So now that we have the background on the book Sybil, what was the impact of Sybil? Well, many believe that this book led to the inclusion of multiple personality disorder, MPD, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, also called the DSM. So let me explore this for a second, because this is kind of interesting, this relationship between Sybil and the inclusion of NPD in the DSM. We see that the first DSM came out in 1952, DSM-1, and dissociative disorders at that time were in the psychoneurotic disorder section. One type of dissociative disorder was dissociated multiple personality. Multiple was in parentheses there. So we see other types as well listed in that DSM, like depersonalization, amnesia, and sleepwalking, for example. In DSM-2, this came out in 1968, we see this is changed to hysterical neurosis dissociative type, right? So multiple personality is now called hysterical neuroses. In DSM-3, this came out in 1980, so this would have been seven years after the book Sybil. We see that dissociative disorders become their own class of disorders in this DSM, and we first see the term multiple personality disorder in the DSM. DSM-4 was released in 1994, and here we see multiple personality disorder is changed to dissociative identity disorder, really emphasizing that the problem was not the multiple personalities, but the lack of a single identity. This same year, 1994, the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, they published the DSM. They warned that this disorder could be overdiagnosed in individuals who were highly suggestible. So the disorder was there, 
but it came with a warning. DSM-5 was released in 2013. We see that dissociative identity disorder is still included, but there's a key change here. The recurrent gaps in recall was no longer just for traumatic events. It was also expanded to everyday events. So the memory problems were expanded in the definition of DID. This is important because amnesia and memory problems in general with DID, this was really supposed to be an important relationship, kind of a defining characteristic of this disorder. So it being changed is kind of interesting, as we see in DSM-5. So in general, there was just a lot of controversy over this disorder in the DSM, and specifically this disorder's relationship to memory. Now in 1970, so this would have been before Sybil was published, there were 79 cases of multiple personality disorder. Again, it was hysterical neuroses at this time, documented in the research literature for the entire world. So 79 cases that we knew about in the whole world. By the mid-1980s, after the book was published, after the television movie, we see that number increases to 6,000. By the year 2000, we see that number increase to 40,000 people. So this is more than 500 times as many people as who were reported to have the disorder in 1970. So 500 times more prevalent than it was in 1970, 30 years before. So was the book Sybil to blame for all this, this whole history of DID? Well, the idea that somebody could have alters, this idea of multiple personality, was already present before Sybil came out, right? So that was already there, but it was really something that a lot of clinicians didn't believe in. It was really more or less a footnote in the world of mental health care. So yes, it was there, but it wasn't till after Sybil was released that this disorder became exceedingly popular. Now I hear this argument that maybe Sybil just raised awareness. So a lot of people had the disorder, but were afraid to come forward until they read the book or until they saw the television movie. But Raising awareness just wouldn't account for this type of difference. If the number of cases increased twofold or threefold, maybe you could say, okay, it's raising awareness. You know, people weren't aware that was even a thing, and then they see it in this movie, so they go in and seek treatment for it. But it can't explain, over the course of 30 years, the prevalence increasing by a factor of 500. That's really just too much for that mechanism of raising awareness. So that could be part of it but that doesn't explain all of it. I think it actually does make sense that Sybil led to the inclusion of multiple personality disorder in the DSM, and that it led to this increase in the number of diagnosed cases. But that's just my opinion. There are a lot of different stories about what really happened, like the impact that Sybil really had. I'm going to cover two of the main stories. These don't cover all the nuances. They're not on a continuum. They're categorical. Again, just two stories. But I think each story sums up pretty well the major positions I've seen expressed out there about this book, Sybil. So with the first story, everybody involved in the book, Wilbur, Mason, and Schreiber, are all heroes who rebelled against a system that did not believe them. They prevailed and won recognition for what was thought to be a rare or non-existent disorder. They caused MPD to be recognized in the DSM and inspired tens of thousands of people to come forward and tell their mental health treatment providers about their symptoms, now in knowing that it was safe to talk about this particular disorder. We even see this International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. This particular group has an award called the Cornelia B. Wilbur Award, right? So Again, with this first narrative, all these people are heroes who successfully lobbied for change in a rigid system. So that's one story. How about the other story? The second story is that Wilbur was biased, deceptive, unethical, horribly mistreated Mason, sold a lie to the public, and this lie has harmed tens of thousands of people because they're diagnosed with a disorder that does not exist or at least a disorder that they don't have. So they're not getting the right treatment for the disorders that they might have. Wilbur's behavior and the publication of the book Sybil demonstrates a tenuous relationship between the field of psychiatry and science, and really by extension, 
all the other mental health treatment fields and science. So counseling, social work, and psychology and their relationship to science. So all the professions kind of get dragged into the mess caused by this one psychiatrist. We see under this story, Mason was mentally ill, but not with multiple personality disorder. She was easily manipulated and exploited by Wilbur. And under this story, Schreiber ignored the facts and went forward and wrote the book, just not worrying about the fact that it wasn't true. So what do I believe? Well, I touched on this a little bit earlier. There's no way to be certain, but if the sources that I read on Sybil are accurate, and again, I'll put the references for those sources in the description for this video. This was a horrible victimization of an innocent person, namely Shirley Mason. Boundary crossing occurred, this was devastating, and there's no excuse for this. Whether DID is real or not, Wilbur misled millions of people to believe that Mason had a disorder that appears she did not have. Now, was all this intentional? There's no way to know whether this was deception or self-deception. Are we talking about one liar, just Wilbur lying, two liars, Wilbur and Mason, or was nobody lying? And that's not even mentioning whatever role Schreiber might have had. I think that certainly it appears that Wilbur was not ethical, again, based on the information that we see, that Mason probably played along. There was money, fame involved here, and at a certain point, Wilbur was really committed. She needed Mason to really have this disorder. It was no longer optional. So in looking at all this information, I would say, again, it seems clear that Wilbur was not acting ethically, and there's really no way to know what Mason's role is. Because Mason was a client, I'm inclined to give her the benefit of the doubt in this situation and run under the assumption that Wilbur manipulated Mason. Again, Wilbur may have been self-deceiving. She may have been fooling herself as well. But either way, this was not a positive situation. This didn't shine a positive light on any of the mental health treatment fields. And I don't think it did any favors to Mason or to people that now have a misunderstanding about this disorder because of reading the book Sybil. If DID does exist, this book undermined people who legitimately have the disorder, right? So now it's harder for people with the disorder to defend that position because of the fact that Sybil was made up, the information in that book was made up. If DID is not real, we have a lot of people, again, kind of believing it is real based on the book Sybil. So, like I mentioned before, whether DID exists or doesn't exist, we see a disservice done here by this particular book. So I know whenever I talk about topics like this, there'll be a variety of opinions. Please put those opinions and thoughts and ideas in the comment section. They're sure to generate a really interesting dialogue around this topic. As always, I hope you found this description of DID and the book Sybil to be interesting. Thanks for watching.